Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for the invitation to come here this evening. I find myself in the invidious position of uh, saying yes but no. Should the troops be in Afghanistan? No, they shouldn't. Should they be out tomorrow? No, they shouldn't. This is a very difficult debating position, as I'm sure you'll understand. I've written about war most of my life. Most of my professional life has been about writing about uh, uh, one military conflict or another, and I've been supportive of most of the wars this country has, has fought in the last 25 years. But I've never been supportive of this war because I've never seen the strategic rationale uh, from day one, and I've never seen the political purpose. The mission in Afghanistan may well survive its critics, but it has a great deal of difficulty surviving its apologists because the apologists don't really know why we're there. At one point, I was able to count uh, eight different reasons, mission statements. You know, this is a counter-terrorist campaign, a counter-insurgency war, a state building, nation building, peacekeeping, peace support, policing, opium eradication. And now, of course, NATO calls it stability enabling, whatever that might possibly be. It's a complete semantic nightmare. If you go to uh, NATO headquarters in Kabul, and I've been twice, you get the jargon. Things like asymmetric means of operation, capacity building, conditionality demand reduction, injectors of risk, light footprints, rolling out a touchstone approach. I'm still not quite sure what that is. Or upskilling. You know, this is the jargon of modern war that's quite true, but it's also uh, a reflection that we're rather embarrassed uh, at what we're doing, and it's also a reflection that we're very confused about what we should be doing. I uh, first went to Afghanistan in 2006 when the British were in command of ISAF, General Richards, in fact, and just a few vignettes. And we went to Kunduz, the provincial reconstruction team. It's the biggest provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, uh, the German, uh, a German one. And it, uh, we were given one of the most pathetic PowerPoint presentations uh, that I've seen, which the general sabotaged very effectively, the poor German colonel, because the German colonel didn't have a clue about what he was supposed to be presenting. And at the end of that, I said to the general, uh, did you really try to sabotage it? And he said, well, let, let's say that the guy turned out top of his class in the staff college in Hamburg in his year. So we have to say the man's got great potential, but neither you nor I are likely to see it realized in our lifetime, are we? We have uh, a British commander who said to me in ISAF, we're fighting a war on two fronts, the first against Taliban, the second against the United States. We're absolutely concerned about what the United States is going to do when it takes over ISAF the following year. We have a coalition of the willing, a bunch of countries, some are more willing than others, some are unwilling to do anything. If you're a Greek, you're not even allowed to leave the base in ISAF, and you only have a four-month uh, stint. And I came back to Bryce Norton on a military plane, sitting next to an SAS guy. This was his third tour in Afghanistan, and he said every year he couldn't see the point of being out there because every year the situation was getting worse and he was leaving the army. He was getting married and leaving the army. Why shouldn't we be there? We were there in 2001 to get rid of Taliban because Taliban refused to hand over Al-Qaeda and any American president would have had to have removed Taliban as a result. Any American president left, right or center. There's a, a great line in P.J. O'Rourke's book, uh, Give Peace a Chance, in which he says about Iraq, sure Iraq's a mess, but remember it's our mess and it's a mess with a message, don't mess with us. That was, the, uh, that was the point of the invasion of Afghanistan. It was a message that was being sent across the world, don't mess with us. And at that point, you could have left. You could have managed the mess. What do I mean by managing the mess? What a lot of American strategists want to do today, send some cruise missiles in and send special forces if Al-Qaeda ever comes back to Afghanistan. But Al-Qaeda isn't coming back to Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda never intended to come back to Afghanistan. The other thing is to do is stick it out and, and, and actually fight it sensibly. But then you would have had to have fought it from 2002 on, and we didn't do that. You may remember Operation Anaconda. That was the first time, a huge, big firefight, when it was clear Al-Qaeda was back in the picture and Taliban was coming back into Afghanistan. And General Franks, the man who delivered the military campaign in 2001, was asked at the US Navy War College by a young cadet, General, what's the nature of this war we're fighting in Afghanistan? He said, son, that's a great question. But don't address it to me address it to the historians. I'm sorry, but the number one point that I, I have to make when I'm at military academies talking about strategy is that if you don't know the nature of the war you're in, you shouldn't be in it. And we simply haven't understood the nature of this campaign from day one. Now, many of you may have remember a great scene uh, in, did any of you see David Lean's film, Lawrence of Arabia, back in the 1960s? There's a wonderful scene where General Allenby, of course, the British guy who's running Egypt, 
And Claude Rains plays as political agent. And Lawrence of Arabia turns up from Aqaba, just having captured Aqaba from the Turks. And so you've got Lawrence dressed as he's famously dressed, and you've got Claude Rains dressed like a British civil servant. And Claude Rains says, you know, Lawrence, you know, we are very similar in many respects, because when we tell the Arabs that they're getting their independence after the war, we're both lying to them. But I get paid by my country to lie to them, and you're lying to yourself. And I wonder who history will judge more culpable, me or you. We've been lying to ourselves. We've been lying to ourselves since 2001. We've been lying about victory. Now, it's sure we've dropped the term victory since David Miliband dropped it a few months ago, but we were promising victory up to this point, except the generals didn't believe it. I remember General Dannett being asked in the press conference, are we winning in, the, in the Afghanistan? And he said, uh, I don't like that word. I prefer to use the word success. Are we being more or less successful? And he said, the answer is yes, however you define success. In other words, this is a war which is being tactically driven, not strategically driven because there is no strategy behind the entire campaign. We're making it up as we go along. That's what I mean about lying to oneself. We've been lying about Karzai's democratic credentials. Now we've dropped Karzai, and we're trying to do local democracy at the local level. It's called leveraging local capacity. So that's what we're supposed to be doing in Afghanistan, leveraging local capacity. Then there's the ridiculous argument that Gordon Brown makes that there will be bombers on the streets of Glasgow if you don't win in Afghanistan. That may be one of the reasons why one of his defence secretaries was also Secretary of State for Scotland. If you actually believe that, it's pretty sensible that you should have this double-headed uh, uh, <laughs> position. Which reminds me, by the way, if we were really to take Afghanistan seriously, we wouldn't have un under-equipped British soldiers as we have. Far more British soldiers have died unnecessarily because this government hasn't found the money in order to secure them properly. And we wouldn't be putting in the defence ministry these over-promoted and under-supported <coughs> defence ministers. A pretty sorry lot from Jeff Hoon onwards. We have lied to the British soldier as well. Very brave, 76 medals for gallantry in 2006, my first year there, alone, including one Victoria Cross. They've been lied to as well. And we will lie to ourselves when we leave Afghanistan in two or three years' time. We'll spin the result. I was reading, just by chance, uh, an article by Ernest Hemingway in the Toronto Star. This was about the third Afghan war, the one in 1919, which Britain won. Everyone forgets that there was a third one. We actually won that one because we used the Air Force to, to bomb the Afghans. But how did we celebrate our victory? We allowed Afghanistan to conclude diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. I think it was the second or third country in the world to recognize the Soviet Union. We'd fought the first two Afghan wars to stop Afghanistan having diplomatic relations with Russia. We won the third one and allowed Afghanistan to have diplomatic relations. It's called spinning, so that you can say you actually won. And Hemingway said, you know, in the past, the Afghans used to hate the British. Now they despise them. And that's the problem. This is what worries me most of all. It's not being hated, it's being despised. And that's why I can't support troops out of Afghanistan at the moment. That's why on this particular issue, I'm in favor of the political consensus that reigns in Westminster, but for completely different reasons from most of the politicians. It's not Afghanistan, it's Pakistan which is the key, and the way in which we disengage as we will, and we will be out of Afghanistan in two years' time, we may even be out of Afghanistan earlier, is that we have to do so in a way that is consistent with the security of this region. I'm particularly concerned about the situation between India and Pakistan. So, that is why I cannot support troops out. At the moment, I take Obama's position, essentially, which is, if we make absolutely no more progress, we have to go within the next two years. No wonder Obama took so long to agree to the surge, because they gamed it. They gamed it for months, and they couldn't see how the surge was going to make any material significance or difference at all. And in the end, he went with the generals. He had to, in a sense. He was boxed in. But he has put a two-year time frame on this, which is much longer than the time frame I would put. I would put a year. But here I am, in the middle of the situation in the best academic tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Not exactly a speech for the yes position, but uh, very well.